Alright, welcome to Foundations of Physics 2. This semester we're going to spend most of the semester talking about electric and magnetic fields and related things such as circuits. Um, so it will be a lot of stuff. But first we're doing a review of vectors. Now vectors, why vectors? There's a lot of math that's important and I could review all of it, but vectors is the thing that was almost certainly for most of you new last semester. Um, and it was obviously important, we used it a lot last semester, but now um, it's going to become not more important, but equally important and integrated throughout a lot of the stuff we do. And it's, uh, the other thing is, is that these fields we're going to be talking about, electric and magnetic fields, are themselves more abstract than something like a velocity. So we want to review vectors because we're dealing with vectors and things that are electric fields that are intrinsically, I think, a little harder to understand and get your hands on than velocity. So I just want to make sure we're in a firm setting with vectors. So here's the thing to remember about a vector. It's a kind of mathematical object that is different from a scalar. A scalar is something that can be represented as just a number. Um, a vector can't be represented as just a number. A vector includes both a magnitude and a direction, whereas a scalar just has an amount and can be negative. In a sense, you could think of a scalar as a magnitude and then either positive or negative. So it's a magnitude and a sign. You can think of a scalar that way, although it's easier just to say, look, it's a number and some numbers are negative. A vector has a magnitude and a direction, and because it's in three-dimensional space, it takes three numbers to fully specify a vector. Um, you could make those three numbers the magnitude and then two angles, one an angle around in the plane, right, so, so which way do I turn, and then the second is what we would call the altitude, how far off of the horizontal plane. That's not how we usually do it. We usually specify three components of the vector, but it takes three numbers to specify a vector. We and so usually they're the components, but vector and scalar are different kinds of mathematical objects. So a vector can never be equal to a scalar. And so it's important to realize when I have a vector equation, it's got to be vectors on both sides. When I add a vector to another vector, I can't add a scalar to a vector. It's just not a defined operation. So the most important thing is remembering vectors are their own things. They're a kind of mathematical object that are more abstract, we represent them with vectors. When we do math with them, usually we're working with components. And here's the other thing about a vector. I just want to say with a velocity vector, so imagine you have a car, and that's its velocity vector. There is nothing sticking out of the car like this. Um, this will come up in, in a place where people really get confused is when we talk about the electric and magnetic fields and electromagnetic waves, right? That the car is just from here to here, and there's nothing sticking out of the car, even though we draw this velocity vector sticking out of it, right? This velocity vector, where does it exist? It exists at the car, really, right? So a car is a big extended object. So imagine just a little small ball or something moving, right? And its velocity vector is that way. Where does the vector exist? At the ball. It, the vector, we represent it as sticking out, but its position in space is that. That's where it is. Although the vector doesn't include where it is, it just includes how much and in what direction the velocity is. So there's nothing about it that sticks out here spatially. That's an important thing to recognize. I'll come back to that a few times this semester. All right, so first question, what angle does the vector V make with respect to the y-axis? So V is equal to 3.0 comma 1.5 comma negative 1.5. And there are no units on this vector, because I just gave you the numbers. And what angle does it make with respect to the y-axis? So to get a feeling for this, I'm going to draw x, y, z. And now I'm going to draw this vector, place it at the origin. So the way we represented this is I'll put a little dot where the vector is. And it's going to have to go 3 in the x direction, 1.5 in the y direction, and minus 1.5 in the z direction. So the vector would point something like that, where if I make the shadow of the vector onto the xy plane, it would be this thing I just drew. This, the, these dots here sort of show you the x and y components. And then the angle that we're looking for is that angle. How the heck do we do this? Well, one thing, just looking at it, we expect it to be between, to be between 0 and 90 degrees somewhere, so hopefully we'll get that. 
how do you do this? Well, what you can do is you can think about what other things do we know about vectors? And there are a couple things here that can help us. The first is if I have two vectors, A and B, I know that the magnitude of A cross B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times sine theta. So I could use that. That would work. That's not the easiest thing to do. There's actually an easier thing to do, and that is that it's not even a magnitude. The dot product of A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times cosine theta. Why is this easier? Two reasons. One, because the dot product just gives me a scalar already, whereas here I would calculate the cross product vector and then have to take the magnitude of it. So there's an extra step. Second, the dot product is just easier to do than the cross product. So let's use this one, but how is that going to help us? Well, what we're after is this angle theta. So if I label this as theta, what we're after is theta. So if I find cosine theta, it's basically the same as finding theta. I just do an arc cosine. We know that cosine theta will equal a dot b divided by the magnitude of a and the magnitude of v, b. So now, for a, I can use v, right? So I can substitute v for a. But then what's b? Well, we want to have a vector that's along the y-axis. Right? So I'm asking for the angle between that and the y-axis. Well, there is a vector along the y-axis, and that is y hat. y hat is equal to 0, 1, 0. It is also unitless. The advantage of a I mean, it's called a unit vector. Why? Because it has unit magnitude. So that's the magnitude of y hat. Let's work out, because we know we're going to need it, let's work out the magnitude of v. And remember, the way you do that is you take the square root of the x component squared plus the y component squared plus the z component squared. Right? So I'm going to stick that in my calculator. Now, and I get 3.67423 to too many sig figs. I only have two sig figs. I am keeping extra sig figs because this is an intermediate number that I'm going to use later. Always do that. All right, so I know that. And so now I can just work this out. So I know that cosine of the angle I want is going to equal v dot y hat divided by the magnitude of v and divided by the magnitude of y hat. So the one other thing I need is v dot y hat. Well, remember the way you do v dot y hat is that you get vx times, I have a notational issue here, so I'm going to substitute the numbers in for y hat. vx times the x component of y hat, which is 0, plus vy times the y component of y hat, so that's just going to be vy there, plus vz times the z component of y hat, which is 0, so aha, uh -huh, v dot y hat is just vy. So the cosine theta, the angle that we're after, is v dot y hat, which is 1.5, divided by the magnitude of v, which is 3.67423, times the magnitude of y hat, which is just 1. So I can work that out. So when I work that out, I get that this uh, is 0 0.40825. That's cosine theta. So if I take an arc cosine of that, I get theta is equal to 1.15 radians, which is also equal to 66 degrees. All right? And just looking at my picture, that looks plausible. 66 degrees, we know it's less than 90. Probably has to be pretty big. So good. So that's how you can do this sort of thing, asking for an angle between Whenever you're asked for an angle between something and something else, like, okay, vectors, I know that the angle of vectors comes into when I evaluate dot and cross products. Can I use those? So that is the first problem. Second problem, very similar, a little bit harder. What is the angle between two vectors, v and u? So here is u vector, u, not u, y-o-u, but u, u. U, 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 is uh, minus 2.3, comma, 1.7, comma, minus 0.5. What a spastic looking comma. Okay. And one of these days I'm going to accept that everything I write looks a little bit spastic. And then V is the same vector that we had in the last problem 3.0, 1.5, comma, minus 1.5. So again, I'm going to try and draw these. 
remember that I drew, so this is for V, X, Y, Z. Oh, by the way, remember you have to have right-handed coordinate systems. So right hand, not left hand. Point along X, cross Y equals Z. So that's how I know that Z has to be out of the board and not into the board. So X goes 3, Y goes 1.5, Z goes 1.5. So that's what V vector looks like. Then U goes minus 2.3 plus 1.7 minus 0.5. Oops. Did you hear that squeak? So that's U vector, and now that is the angle that we're looking for. So I'm going to just do the same thing here. I know that U dot V has to equal the magnitude of U times the magnitude of V divided by um, not divided by times, cosine theta. So therefore, cosine theta is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v divided by, I'm having so much trouble here, cosine theta is equal to u dot v divided by magnitude of u times the magnitude of v. So I've just got, I can just count put this in and calculate it. I'm going to do a few sub-calculations first, just because if I plugged the numbers in all at once, it would be a huge mess. So I'll figure out, what's the magnitude of u? Well, that's the square root of 2.3 squared. Really, negative 2.3 squared, but I know if I square the negative number, it's going to be positive. Plus 1.7 squared plus 0.5 squared. I know that v V's magnitude, I actually already know this because I calculated it before. But I'll write it down again. 3 squared plus 1.5 squared plus 1.5 squared. And finally, I need to know u dot v, which is going to equal, um, I'll write it out this time, ux vx plus uy vy plus uz vz. That's just how you do a dot product. Remember, the meaning of the dot product is something like the product of these two um, the two magnitudes, but then you have this angle that sort of says how much along V is U, and notice, well, it's not, it's opposite. So we expect the dot product to be negative, just looking at this, because U is more opposite than along V, but then, you know, if I extended V back this way, and I try and take a sort of perpendicular projection, how long is U along V? That's kind of what the dot product tells you. So the dot product is biggest when two vectors are parallel. When they're perpendicular, they're not along each other at all, the dot product is zero. So I can put in these numbers, and so that's going to be minus 2.3, and here I do have to keep track of the negative. I'm not squaring a number, so it won't go away. Times 3.0 plus 1.7 times 1.5 plus minus 0.5 times minus 1.5. So I have these three things to calculate, and I'm going to do that. All right, so V vector, just like before, is 3.6742. Uh, the magnitude of U vector is 2.9034, I should use a bigger font, 0.9034, and then U dot V works out to be minus 3.6. It's actually perfect, but I'm going to go ahead and put in a couple zeros to indicate I am keeping extra digits. And as I predicted, it was going to be negative. So that tells me now I can put in these numbers, cosine theta, U, U dot V on the top, so that's minus 3.6 divided by the magnitude of u, 2.9034, also divided by the magnitude of v, 3.6742. Put all these numbers together, and we get minus 0.3375. It is negative, that's okay, cosines can be negative. Um, Really what that means, if it's negative, is it's going to be an angle between 90 and 180 degrees, which is what we expect looking at that. So if I arc cos this, I'll figure out the arc cosine of minus 0.3375 is 1.92, or if you want to put it in degrees, 110 degrees. Now we have two significant figures here, because all these numbers that went into it were good to two. Really, I should check to make sure the sum is, but it's going to be two from that. So there's two, two, two. So I only have two sig figs, although I kept three here. It's not a real big deal if you keep one extra. The reason is when it starts with a one, 
if you care, come talk to me in my office hours. Sometimes you want to have an extra, and this is actually good to three sig figs also, but really there's two sig figs in the answer. So that is how you do problem two, another angle problem. Third problem. By using vector components, explicitly show that distribution works for dot products, i.e. a dot b plus c is equal to a dot b plus a dot c. Okay, that's distribution. Now the other thing is show that. How do you show something? Well, what you do is you start with the thing you've started with. You do legal algebraic manipulations until you get down to something that is self-evidently true, something like 1 equals 1. Okay, 1 equals 1, I know that. Um, so to give you an example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to step back, and let's just to remind you, what is distribution that you're used to from algebra? That would just be a times b plus c is equal to a, b plus a, c, but these are not vectors now. Now I'm talking if these were scalars, that's what distribution is. And because these are scalars, I could divide both sides by a, Right? I can do that. Um, I couldn't do that up here. Right? I'm doing this in the dotted line because it's naughty. I can't divide both sides by a vector because dividing by a vector is not a defined operation. And that's why you say, well, why, why isn't it just obvious that this works? Well, it's not obvious that it works, actually. Even though this works, it's not obvious that this works. So here, if I divide both sides by a, I can cancel this. Now here, this is a mistake a lot of you make in algebra a lot of time. I don't just cancel that with one of them. It has to be in every term up here. Another way of thinking about this is when you divide by something, that's the same as multiplying by um, one over that something. And now what I'm going to do, this is going to become a little bit tautological, because I'm now going to distribute this in here, and I'm trying to show distribution. but we'll go with it. If I distribute 1 over a into that, it becomes a b over a plus a c over a. Now you recognize, oh wait, that's a common denominator. I could write it like that. But here it's also more obvious that you can cancel that, and you get b plus c. And then from here, I have b plus c. And so this is, that's supposed to be a check mark. This is a thing that is self-evidently obvious. b plus c is equal to b plus c. Yes, we're good with that. Did I only do legal algebraic operations? Well, yes as long as a isn't zero. So I could say in the special case of a equals zero, it's zero equals zero plus zero, so it still works. But it actually works for any a, b, and c. All right, so good. That's how I would do it with scalars. Now, because I can't divide by the vector, I, the same method is not going to work for vector distribution. But I suggest by using vector components, you should be able to show that this is true. So what I'm going to do is write all these terms out in terms of components to see if I can then make that into something that is self-evidently true. So let's start with the left side. I need to dot b plus c with a, so I'll start by, oh, how sad, I liked that color. Um, I'll start by writing down what is b plus c. Oh, this one's dead too. Christmas, Christmas did this to me. I'll start by writing down what b plus c is, right? So the way you add vectors, if you write it as components, is you just add the x components, you add the y components, and you add the z components. Yay. All right, so having b plus c, now I need to do a dot b plus c. And remember, a dot product, sometimes called the scalar product, gives you a scalar. And what you do is you multiply the x components by each other, and it's got to be bx plus cx. Um, inside parentheses, because I'm multiplying the x component by the whole x component of the other one, plus ay times by plus cy, plus az times bz plus cz. Okay, I'm just going to leave this like this for now. So this is the left-hand side, and now let's do the right-hand side. So I need to get a dot b. a dot b is equal to ax bx plus ay by plus az bz. And a dot c is equal to ax cx plus ay cy plus az cz. And so therefore, this is going to be long, a dot b plus a dot c 
is equal to, here it comes, AXBX plus AYBY plus AZBZ plus AXCX plus AYCY plus AZCZ. <sighs> okay, see sometimes you have to write long things. It's not bad, it's, you know, it's not hard, it's just long. Now, notice here, this is not self-evidently the same as this. So what do I do? Well, notice here, I could multiply this whole thing out and then make sure each term here is a term over here. But the other thing I could do, so that, that would be fine. In fact, what I, here's one thing I could do. I could multiply this out and then subtract AXBX from both sides, and I would have had one here. And subtract AYBY from both sides, I would have had one there. So on and so forth. I'll have to subtract an AZCZ from both sides. Oh, look, I would have had one there. Once I was done subtracting it, I would have 0 equals 0, which is self-evidently obviously true. Okay, but instead what I'm going to do is notice I have, I'm just going to rewrite this in a different order. AXBX plus um, AXCX, because remember addition, and this is just these, this on the right side is all just scalars, no vector weirdness, and addition is commutative. So I have that plus AYBY plus AYCY plus AZBZ plus AZCZ. Now, when rearranging terms like this, you have to be careful that you don't leave any out and that you don't introduce any that weren't really there. But I did that okay here. Um, so, you know, I can check, just make sure each one of these, and one thing I might do is like underline them as I'm making sure they're down here. Okay, but now when I see this, it's like, oh, and I know how to factor AX out of this little piece here, so I can say AX times BX plus CX, because, you know, I can factor that little piece. Oh, look, I can factor AY out of this little piece. And I can factor AZ out of this little piece. And now, if I look at this and this, they are exactly the same. So that proves that distribution works for dot products. So now if you ever see a construction like this, you could rewrite it like this and vice versa. That's the third problem. Last problem. A ball is moving with constant velocity v. Now, v, I'll just write this. It's constant velocity, so this is the velocity at all times, of minus 25.0 comma minus 2.0 comma 1.0 meters per second. This vector does have units. I could write it out on each component or I could just write it out like this either way. It starts a distance of 68 meters away. So remember a distance is a magnitude. So it doesn't give me a direction. So I'll notice it's 68 meters away from the origin. So that's the distance from the origin in the plus x direction. So what that really tells me is that the initial position R0 is 68, zero, no, comma zero, comma zero, right? That is 68 meters away along the plus x axis, right, in the plus x direction. Okay, when and where does the ball cross the yz plane? What does that even mean? So what we have here is a ball that starts here out a distance 68 meters, so this is at t equals zero, say, just pick a starting time. At t equals zero, it starts 68 meters away along the x-axis, that's x, that's y, that's z. Its velocity, if I drew it, well, it would be, if that's, I, I mean, I just have to make it sort of scaled, right? It's uh, 25 in x, minus two in y, and one in z. So it's going something like that at a very small angle. Right, so that's 25 to 1, but again, this is meters per second. So does this doesn't have to be 25 compared to this 68 because they're not comparable. This is 68 meters. This vector is however many, whatever the magnitude, close to 25 meters per second. So you can't compare this to this. So I'm just going to draw it in that direction. And then we know it's moving in that direction. It's constant velocity. And the question is, where does it hit the yz plane. So starting by this and drawing it, I see, okay, it looks like it really will hit the yz plane. So what does it mean to hit the yz plane? What is true everywhere on the yz plane? 
How can I say this with math? Well, the yz plane is defined by what? It's defined by x equals 0. So the yz plane is everywhere x is equal to 0. So I want to figure out both when and where. Let's start with when. When is x equal to 0? Well, I know how to do that because I know that r sub x is going to equal r sub x 0 plus v sub x times t. I'm going to add in also plus 1 half a sub x t squared. So this is the x component of one of those kinematic equations we had from last term, except we don't need this one because a sub x is equal to 0 because it's moving at a constant velocity. That's our x. What I'm really after is t, so I'm just going to solve this for t. So r sub x minus r sub x 0 divided by v sub x is equal to t. So I subtracted rx0 from both sides divided by vx. So I can figure that out. R sub x is what? Well, at the time we care about, that's when x is 0. So that's 0. Minus r sub x 0 is 68 meters. Divided by v sub x is minus 25.0 meters per second. So that's 68 meters divided by 25.0 meters per second. So the meters cancels meters. I have 1 over 1 over seconds. So I could multiply the top and the bottom by seconds. That would cancel. I'll get 68 over 25.0 seconds. Well, OK, I could stop there. Technically, I'm done, but I'm going to actually calculate it. And I get 2.72 seconds. Zero, 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 zero. That works out to be perfect there. It's only good to two sig figs, because we only have two sig figs in the 68, but I'm going to keep all of them for now. So that's when. Where. What does where mean? It means basically we already know what x is when it hits the yz plane. x is 0. But what is y and what is z when it hits the yz plane? Well, we can use the same equation again, but in a different color because we like colors. A different shade of brown, really. So we know y at time t. So this is not y times t. I mean y is a function of t. It's function notation. It's going to equal y0 plus vyt. Um, so that's going to equal minus 2.0 meters plus Vy, I lied to you, Y0 is 0 meters, right, because it starts, that's R0, Y0 is that, and then Vy is plus minus 2.0 meters per second times T, which is 2.72 seconds, yay. And then z at time t, so here I'm writing it in function notation again, z of t is z0 plus vzt, which again, z starts at 0, that's the initial z, plus vz is 1.0 meters per second times 2.72 seconds. Um, all right, and so what that tells me, and I, I just have to multiply these numbers out, it crosses the yz plane at 0, comma 2.72, so that's going to be 2 five, times 2 is 4, plus 14 is 5.44, okay. Um, it's going to be minus times plus, so 0, comma minus 5.44, um, and y, see y is negative, uh, comma, and then 1 times 2.72 is easy, 2.72 meters. So here is the when. And here is the where. The hardest part of this was, I think, recognizing what does it mean to cross the yz plane. So think about how do I say with math the yz plane? That's this. Then you can use the kinematics, figure out t, use the t to figure out the position. All right, that is it for this week, um, or this set of video problems. I'll see you all on Friday.